Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat, and with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. Wisdom found not a place on earth where she could inhabit. Her dwelling, therefore, is in heaven. Wisdom went forth to dwell among the sons of men, but she obtained not a habitation. Wisdom returned to her place and seated herself in the midst of the angels. But iniquity went forth after her return, who unwillingly found a habitation and resided among them as rain in the desert and as dew in a thirsty land. The Book of Enoch, Chapter 42. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio. And as always, I thank all of you for taking the time to join us this evening. I appreciate your patronage and your fellowship and for always entrusting us with your focus and your attention. I'm honored to be joined this evening by Lauren Peterson. Lauren, are you there, brother? Yes. All right. Most excellent. If you would, before we continue, um, just share a little bit about yourself or um, you, those that may not have heard of you, what you do, the radio broadcast that you and John have been doing, any contact or anything you know, uh, web-related that you'd like to share. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in uh, my early years. I grew up uh, mostly in the 60s and 70s, but I grew up in a traditional church environment, a Methodist church. So I received a traditional training uh, back uh, teaching back in those years, and uh, it was on the conservative side. So in, uh, but in uh, about my senior, junior, senior uh, year in uh, high school, um, <clears throat> I started reading some uh, pretty heady books, <laughs> and uh, for for that time, uh, one of them was um, um, uh, Genesis Flood by Whitcomb and Norris uh, Morris. <laughs> okay, and that's a pretty uh, heavy duty book gets into the uh, actual physics of the uh, Genesis creation account um, from a creationist point of view. And I didn't understand creationist versus otherwise back in those days. So I simply read the book and uh, <clears throat> it, it sounded reasonable to me and what they were putting forth. Um, the, um, the early um, Chariot of the Gods book, I read that, I think was in 74, and then a year later in 75, um, after my first year in college as a summer, uh, 75, God just blew the barn doors off my, my mind. I had a number of questions that were not being answered by traditional ter church teaching nor uh, traditional science. So God, from that whole summer, led me from one book to another to another to another. And some were secular, some were Christian-based. But just like, whoa, you know. And it's been on a, a journey ever since that time. And so um, now a, a friend of, uh, of Zen and I, uh, Zen and my friend, uh, John, he goes by the, the handle John the Baptist. But uh, we do a show together. Um, it's recorded on Saturday mornings and played a week later on uh, Saturday evenings. And it's called the Peterson Chronicles. Where, um, yeah, believe it or not, it's four and a half years now and still talking about the creation account. So that's just how deep it goes. <laughs> it's like, that's you know, right. what? how can you possibly talk four and a half years about the creation account? You know, well, it's because once you dig deep into it, you realize that it involves a whole Bible from cover to cover. It's just it's everywhere. 
And it's, it's just one level of, of uh, understanding after another level after another level. And then I like to bring in like current articles of, you know, some, some uh, maybe some discovery or some theory, you know, in the scientific realm or something. And to bring that in on the discussion and see how that plays out. Uh, in the biblical time frame of things. <clears throat> so currently I've been discussing for a number of shows a uh, simple article where a couple of uh, DNA scientists were uh, determined to uh, prove that the DNA could be tracked and, and backtrack through time and prove the theory of evolution. And maybe some of you have read this already because this, this article's been out for a, a few months already. And uh, <clears throat> as hard as they tried through their um, their uh, research, it actually turned the theory of evolution on its head. <laughs> okay, turned it upside down, inside out. They could not prove the theory of evolution through their research of DNA. Um, <clears throat> so I go into that and the way that they uh, lay out their their results and what they think it might. Uh, imply kind of thing. And then I try to con contrast that with, okay, what time periods in the Bible would, or time period in the Bible would that most likely happen? So that then requires going beyond just, well, Noah's flood would be one thing, one time period that people might jump to, to that conclusion, but it would be a wrongful conclusion. Another one might be, um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, well, the initial creation story itself uh, as traditionally taught uh, but I don't think that's it either so I go into the various time frames and then that gets uh, when you go into the various time frames like somewhat like Zena and I are going to be doing this evening to explain the um, the aspect of the Holy Spirit then also requires an understanding of what happened long ago and you know that kind of thing so there's a lot more Whenever you say, well, this is this, okay, there's a lot more behind that explanation than just simply this is this, and now we can all go home and go to sleep. <clears throat> right, yeah, absolutely. It gets uh, very deep, and there's so many levels to truth and revelation that are brought forth in the Word, and especially when you begin to look at the original Word, the context of the, the Hebrew and the Greek, um, there, you know, it gets even deeper and deeper. Um, but anyway, so we'll begin with looking at Genesis 1, because uh, we see there that in verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Second verse, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And in verse 3, we have, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And in my opinion, these first three verses, you can conceptualize the entire trinity of, you know, where it says in First John, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And we see that God, Elohim, which we know, Yahuwah, Lord God, uh, the Father, they created the heaven and the earth, and then we see in the second verse that the Spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, moves upon the face of the waters, and then the voice of the Father calls forth the light, let there be light, and there was light, in my opinion, that light is Christ, as it says in Revelation, that he is the light of the world. And so, uh, again, in my opinion, we see here in the very first three verses of Genesis, a revelation of the Holy Trinity as being the pre-existent Godhead, which brought all things into bring and brought all, you know, basically manifests uh, the entirety of creation as they are the source and force uh, of life. And even, you know, with the physics of uh, spirit and light and sound frequency, that everything in its uh, essence is light, 
and sound and frequency and vibration and that light steps down from being ethereal to taking on form and becoming physical and matter and dimensions and uh, and even what we see now in the physicality. So uh, let me get you to comment on that and then we'll, we'll move forward. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> amen. So it's like, well, which came first, the, the painting or the painter? <laughs> okay. Right, so right. it's kind of a simple question here, which came first, the creation or the creator of that creation? So that would then imply that the Godhead pre-existed the creation yes so yeah so uh but there's a lot of people out there who who believe in that god is one as in a um singular entity one you know mm -hmm. that the father the son the holy spirit well they're just all the same being and different personas or manifestations of that same one being uh, but again i was taught and uh, <clears throat> sometimes when you're taught something early on it sticks with you but sometimes those can get challenged later on in life and where you're taken deeper into a deeper understanding and maybe sometimes even change a position that you had when you were like a kid or something so but that's still a, a traditional teaching that has stayed with me i i see no compelling argument to believe otherwise that there is not a trinity and um, so I'm going to, um, let's see, I'm going to go into even Genesis 1-1 that you had quoted there. Early on this year, I was reading through this in preparation for uh, something I was going to talk about in, on one of the shows. And I'm just, just letting, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you read a scripture and for me anyway, it's like, excuse me, the Holy Spirit just like can almost like grabs hold of my eyes and, and like, yes. hey, did you see this? Did you, you know, focus on this? <laughs> what is this right. saying to you, you know? I said, wow, yeah. Okay, so I'm looking right now. I got pulled up, and this is what was revealed to me early on in the year. And it's like, you know, we read this all the time, but we don't get the, the deeper meaning of it even after 40, 50, 60 years of knowing this verse. We just kind of tend to take some of these verses for granted and we just leave them on the shelf without never re-examining them under a new light of the Holy Spirit directed light. Okay, so it's right here in the beginning. So um, in, in, in my opinion, a lot of people get tripped up on that phrase, those three words, in the beginning, um, <clears throat> because Jesus refers to uh, in the beginning as well. And there's other... Um, verses that refer to in the beginning, okay? So you can look at that in the beginning as three three words, quote, in the beginning, unquote. What I believe the Lord showed me um, a, few, a few years ago was in, quote, the beginning, end quote. Now, what's the difference? In the beginning, three words all in once, implies uh, from point zero, from the get-go in quote the beginning unquote implies in that time before time now if you don't know what the time before time is zen's done i'm sure zen you've done a lot of deep dive on that right mm -hmm. the time right. before time right mm -hmm. and yeah and, and you know i haven't done as deeply as zen has but i've encountered that understanding as the time before time in the beginning okay the beginning that time before time so what time are we talking about this is the beginning that beginning time of creation when everything was created and set up and oper and put in operational capacity the beginning, the beginning phase of things, you know, when everything was perfect and harmonious. So when you look at this in the Hebrew, you go to um, Strong's um, and you look at the Hebrew and the, the uh, in the Hebrew language, again, I kind of just recently kind of came to this understanding is that in the Hebrew language, I guess, and I'm no Hebrew scholar by any means, but Oftentimes, uh, a particular word or, you know, various words will be assigned either a, a masculine or a feminine quality to them. 
Uh, one way of looking at it, like in the English language, if we, uh, a ship, for example, oftentimes a ship is referred to in the feminine example, okay? Uh, we we ra rarely say uh, in regards to a ship, he, okay? It's usually she, you know? Uh, so why is that? I don't know, but that's just kind of the way it is. <clears throat> well, the Hebrew, if we, it's, it's a more... Um, ancient and direct language. Um, there's a lot to Hebrew that maybe even escapes sometimes the Hebrew scholars. Um, <clears throat> but it's a deep language. There's a lot to it. It uh, doesn't waste any real estate in verbiage. It's, there's a lot of layers upon layers within the Hebrew. And <clears throat> you have to be very careful. It's kind of like in the English language where you can have any given word in English language sometimes can have multiple meanings depending on the context in, in which that word is used, and likewise in Hebrew. So, <clears throat> again, I'm no Hebrew scholar, but just in looking at the Strong's uh, lexicon here, in the beginning, um, it's it gives the Hebrew word for those three English words, and it's a preposition and a noun, feminine singular, okay? And then God is referred as as a, as a noun, masculine plural. Okay, so feminine singular. <clears throat> so what what the Lord showed me, I think, was early this year, was that how do things get? You know, look at the world. It's like look at the world around you. How do, how does just about everything get their beginning? It's through the birthing process. Yes, right. And how does the birthing process happen? It's through a womb. Woman, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's simple 101 biology here, folks. It's nothing complicated. Right. Okay, it's simple biology. In the beginning, uh, now because we have, you know, mankind has sinned so badly and has taken those things that were meant to be beautiful by God and have twisted and turned them and, and contorted them and have made the holy into. <laughs> you know, very base and, and uh, horrible. So something as beautiful as a womb, okay, is supposed to be beautiful, and it's just trashed, okay? Mm. So we think of God in the sense of sexuality. We think, oh, that's just disgusting. How can you think that way, you know? Because we look at sexuality from our fallen state and how bad it's gotten in our interpretation and our implementation of sexuality. And so then when we think of God in that term, we think, oh, that just can't be. But God's ways are higher than our ways, and his ways are sin-free, which our ways yeah. are sin-overflowing. <laughs> okay? mm -hmm. So it's very difficult for us to get a proper view on how God really set things up and how beautiful and wonderful uh, things were meant to be in the beginning okay so that in the beginning how do things get their beginning in the natural world around us so when god constructed this natural around, uh, world around us for the benefit of adam and eve and the adamites it was also to be as examples for us to understand in this reality a much larger reality out there if that makes sense that there is a larger reality beyond this reality and so by understanding the simple mechanics, the simple 101s in our realm, we can begin to understand the higher realities in the higher realms. So we understand that, you know, I'm, I'm maybe going to sound a little gross here, and I don't mean to, but it's just, again, simple. You know, a man's sperm can fall to the ground all, all he wants, and it's not going to do anything. It's just wasted sperm, okay? It mm -hmm. requires a womb to bring forth that new life. So in that respect, God can speak, the Father can speak all the words he wants to speak. And every one of them fall to the ground null and void, of none effect. It requires the womb of the Holy Spirit to bring forth gestation and nurturement within the womb and to bring it forth when it's ready. Yes. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. And I fully agree because everything is begotten of woman. And even Christ, the Savior Messiah, is referenced as the only begotten. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So that was like a like a big like wow right there. The first three words <laughs> opening in the Bible there mm -hmm. is evidence of the Holy Spirit. Right. Absolutely. And the other thing which you brought up um, 
and that most people don't look at or examine in great detail, especially those that are vehemently opposed to this concept, is that when you examine the word, you know, the because it is a feminine noun with regard to the Ruach and the Holy Spirit, um, she is referenced as being feminine in the ancient manuscripts before the alteration, before the uh, the changing or what became the, um, you know, the, the translation into Greek that previously in the Aramaic, in the ancient Syriac, uh, in the ancient Hebrew, the Holy Spirit was referenced as the feminine aspect of the Godhead. And this is still encoded into the Bibles, even our modern English translations today that you find in Proverbs, the reference to the Holy Spirit as wisdom, uh, as being a she. And even in the book of Enoch, which I read from at the very beginning of the show, you see this same concept being conveyed. But with regard to in the beginning, I'll share two passages which are reference to the Holy Spirit. And again, it reveals how wisdom as the Holy Spirit pre-existed with the Father and the Son, and how, as you said, she was the womb from which all the manifestation of creation with the word calling forth, uh, that it was there work together which then brought forth in manifestation what we see of the creation and so in proverbs chapter 3 verse 19 it says god with wisdom set the foundations of the earth and set in order the heavens with understanding and if you read all of proverbs you see numerous times multiple dozens of times uh, wisdom and the Holy Spirit are referenced as being feminine. Um, in Proverbs chapter 8, which is deeply uh, profound, it says, God created me at the beginning of his creation. Before, and also for the people that don't know, I'm, I'm reading from the Targum version, which is the Aramaic. It's the oldest translation of the Hebrew Torah, predating the Septuagint by 200 uh, years. God created me at the beginning of his creation, before his works in the beginning. Before the world, I was made ready. From the beginning, before the earth was. While there was still no depths, I was born. And while there were no streams, storehouses of water, before the mountains took shape, and before the hills, I was begotten before he had made the earth and rivers or the beginning of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, there was I. And while he drew the circle on the face of the deep, and when he made substantial the clouds above and made strong the springs of the deep, and when he set for the sea its limit, that the water should not piss beyond, set the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him a faithful handmaiden. And while he was rejoicing in me day by day, I was rejoicing before him always. And so we see here, you know, that uh, wisdom is referenced as being a handmaiden. So, yeah. you know, a lot of people here interpret this passage as being uh, reference to the pre-existent Christ, but this is actually speaking about the Holy Spirit as being, again, the feminine aspect of the Godhead that pre-existed with the Father and the Son. And so, in my opinion, we see that even the human family, um, Adam and Eve and you know their holy child, uh, Seth, uh, well, because Cain murdered his half-brother Abel, but they represent, the family represents the sanctity of the Godhead. And that we see that, you know, God is love in, 
its most deeply profound and truthful aspect, God is love. And it is through the family and through love that, you know, the creation is propagated and has continuance. And so we see that, you know, the family is created, in my opinion, in the image and to mirror what we see in the Godhead. And looking to Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28, and speaking about humanity, we see that uh, man was created in the image. Uh, male and female created he them. And that word he is not in the original text. Like even if you look up the, the Strong's, there's no word for the he there. And so it's... Uh, you know, God created them, male and female. And so, you know, there's no reference to gender as far as associated to the Godhead there. But, um, so I thought that was very interesting. And then again, you know, like I said, when you look at the uh, original Aramaic and Hebrew and the Syriac, the ancient Syriac, we see that the Holy Spirit is referenced as the feminine aspect of the Godhead, which makes sense according to the creation, because we see that the creation is made male and female and that it is only through woman that anything is brought forth that it takes, as you said, a womb to manifest. But uh, comment? Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, you know, be because of the traditional teaching of the uh, creation account, and of course I was aware of uh, Genesis 1, um, 26 through 28 that you quoted there. And uh, then... Uh, be year, years later, you know, uh, the Lord gets me focused back on there in in relation to what what does that more fully mean, uh, male and female, and so in lo looking deeper at that, well, if Adam and Eve were created in the image and likeness of the Most High, then logically <laughs> that would mean exactly. that Adam was was uh, reflective of God the Father. The, the masculine, the fatherhood, and right. then Eve was reflective of the Holy Spirit. But the problem is that traditionally the Holy Spirit has been taught to be male. Yes. But that was my aha moment that the Lord took me on like years ago was, but I didn't dare tell say anything to anybody because already in those early years, people were telling me, oh, that's of the devil, you know, and you should get rid of all your books and you got too much time to think on your hands, you know, <laughs> you better get a job or something, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of stuff, you know. But that early under, as a switched over for me was to zero in on those verses. What do they mean? Okay, so if the Godhead logically was all male, as is traditionally taught, <clears throat> then th why is there a problem with Adam and Steve? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Right, right. <laughs> well, uh, you know, logically, if uh, God would have created Adam and Steve, and I'm not trying to blast <laughs> anybody who's homosexual, just trying to illuminate a more clear understanding of this creation account and what it means. Okay, well, Adam and Steve cannot beget children of, of their own uh, through, the, through themselves. They can try all they want, and they're not going to have any children. And, and right. God is a family-orientated God. Our Abba Father is a family-orientated. And so he set up his earthly family, I believe, as Adam and Eve were the direct seed line of the Most High God. Absolutely. Did. Yes. A direct seed line. And so in that respect, it would make sense then logically— Simple, 101 makes sense that Adam would reflect the Father, Eve would reflect the Holy Spirit, and the children they would have would reflect Jesus, the only begotten. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, I fully agree with you. And, I, you know, since I've been talking about and, and really just bringing forth this revelation ever since it came to me, because um, I've read and studied it many times in reading the extra biblical and extra canonical texts and and then revisiting that in the uh in the canon i realized it was still encoded therein as well and that what had happened is that when the manuscripts were 
translated into Greek, that's when everything was changed. And that um, even in the division of the churches from the Western Roman Catholic and from what is the Eastern, uh, the Orthodox churches, that they follow a different Bible as well. Whereas, you know, in the, here, even the King James is based upon, uh, as far as the New Testament, the Greek Septuagint, that in the um, Eastern churches, they follow what is called the Peshitta for the Old Testament, that we have a translation of that from George Lamza, and that it is based upon the Aramaic translation of the Hebrew Torah without the corruption of the Greek being inserted into it, um, because this is one of the predominant things that was changed, and that there are even the New Testament, you can find Aramaic translations of it where it also reflects these things that we're speaking about here. Um, for instance, I just recently found a text called the Kaburis text, which is very interesting. I should have actually sent you this previously, but you can check it out at another time and then uh, we'll okay. make comment on it. But let me find the text and I'll post a link and send you a link. But okay. it's um, interesting in that this New Testament translation being Aramaic, it goes back to, you know, the first century uh, CE and to right after uh, all this had kind of gone down with the apostles and the collection of the gospels. And, and um, I'll read just a little bit about it, the introduction. And, and then I'll send you the link, but reading it, you really get, and you can find it online and then freely available on PDF. And it's a, you know, it gives you clear more insight. Like it's like reading the, the Targum, um, which again I had made mention about how the Targum was the first translation of the Hebrew Torah, dating back to the time when the Israelites were released from the exile of Nebuchadnezzar, and then rebuilding, reestablishing the uh, the temple, the holy temple. And I think it was 447 BC. That's when the Targum came into being. And it's, you know, again, predates the Greek by 200 years. And when you read it, you get great clarity in much more detail on things that have been lost or made ambiguous within the, um, within the King James and the modern English version and also the, the Greek Septuagint. But this particular text, let me uh, pull this up. And it has all the different portions. Here, I'll go ahead and post a link to you and to the chat room before I share comment on this. But okay. I'll just read the Wikipedia on it just to, you know, general doesn't have to be, and I'll post this in the chat and then we'll comment it. But it's a, it's an interesting manuscript. It's one to definitely look at parallel accounts, especially for those that are interested in studying, um, you know, all the parallel translations, which I like to read all of them, you know, to get greater insight into just what the word is revealing and what is coming forth and all the different. So here we go. It's called the Kaburis Codex. And here's what it says just in the wiki about it. The Kaburis Codex refers to two manuscripts in the Aramaic language. The earlier of the two is in early Aramaic manuscript in the New Testament dating to between 300 310 CE. Okay, I thought it was earlier than that. I think there is one newer copy that was, I mean, it's an older copy, but uh, lately discovered. 
And the later copy is the 10th century duplicate thereof, the Kuburis Codices contained the complete Peshitta New Testament containing 22 books in comparison to the Western New Testament canon, which contains 27 books. The missing books are known as the Western Five, namely 2 Peter, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. And so you can find and read these particular uh, texts. And uh, also here it says the early Kaburas Codex has been carbon dated to the first decade of the fourth century. Um, but in some of the, you know, again, some of the other texts, it dates it actually back. I find that they always try to date it, you know, later than what it usually is. And uh, with regard to manuscripts, but especially those that make mention of Christ, um, like the book of Enoch, you know, because they want to say that all the prophecies of Christ were written after he had already incarnated into being. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so they yeah. try to defer from that. But go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah, I'll find some evidence that it, uh, those prophecies go way, way back. Right. So and so. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so there's no way that could have been written after the fact, you know. The book oh, of yeah. Enoch is pr provable, you know. <laughs> right, right. And so even the Book of Enoch now, you know, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see that um, it is dated way back and previous to the coming of Christ, which confirms that those portions that are written on the Son of Man and the prophecies of his coming and also that, you know, because it makes mention of his first incarnation as well as his second advent, that those things are prophetically accurate. And so mm -hmm. in my mind, it shows that, you know, the book of Enoch is inspired as well as many other texts like uh, the T Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs was found also in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it, too, makes mention of um, not only the prophecies of the coming of Christ, but it also uh, cites and that the 12 patriarchs knew about what would occur prophetically because they had read it um, from the books of Enoch. And so here they are sourcing, like Jude does, you know, the books of Enoch with reference to uh, the prophecies and the understanding as to how Israel would fall away and the certain tribes and the the different children of the certain tribes would also fall away. And so those are very interesting readings as well. But, and that's why I like to study and look at and examine these, you know, these different books because we learn and gain insight, especially with regard to prophecy. In my opinion, prophecy is the fingerprint of the Most High God that you know, those things cannot have been inspired by anybody unless under the influence of the Holy Spirit, as it says in Second Peter, but quote. That's, that's mean, right. Amen. So our Abba Father holds holds the rights to the to the uh, <laughs> final outcome, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Like uh, in talking of like movies or books, you know, the rights, you know, and, and ancillary rights, you know, and uh, everything. Our Heavenly Father retains ultimate rights over his creation and over you and me. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, so the old devil, he's a squatter. He, he, he likes everybody to think he's got the rights, but he, he ain't got nothing. <laughs> okay. He, he ain't got no rights. <clears throat> Other right. than what we, um, out of our ignorance, allow him to, to obtain. Exactly. Or if you invite him into your yeah. life or yeah. you commit sin in such way that he then has dibs over you. Yeah. Well, then, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, wow. You know, it's like in, in uh, preparing for the show tonight, I was doing some. Uh, you know, research and uh, and things. And so um, the stuff you've been just talking about now is like, yeah, yeah, I remember reading that just in the last several days, okay, uh, of what you're talking about. <clears throat> and it, it drives home, okay, from the, tr 
from the traditional perspective, being raised in a traditional church and even in today's environment, that these traditional concepts and beliefs are drilled into our heads. And so we don't question them. And anybody right. who does, well, you're, you're a heretic or <laughs> a blasphemer yeah. or something, or maybe you should really leave the church someday soon, <laughs> uh, something like that, okay? But imagine also if you're um, a Muslim and you've been raised, brought up under the Quran, and it's been drilled in your head. And so that's how you believe. That's your worldview. You have no reason to believe otherwise. You're, you're anchored into it. But... <clears throat> If the Holy Spirit moves upon you, okay, that even though, okay, so like you were saying, is um, in translating from Hebrew into Greek is not a 100% straight across translation. There's there's certain words and phrases and things that get lost in the translation. <clears throat> and then from Hebrew into English or Greek into English or Aramaic into English, okay, it, it, there are certain things that can get mistranslated, even contorted. Uh, and then you, in the, you know, if you have anybody on the translation team that has an ulterior motive to like fudge it a little bit to, to render a different outcome, right? <clears throat> or to conceal the ultimate truth behind this phrase or this understanding of things because we don't want. <laughs> You know, those roughins out there to understand what we understand, <laughs> okay? Uh, then, then you know, that can enter in to the mix, too. But nevertheless, as much as the 66 book canon may have been dorked around with a little here and a little there to try to render a different outcome, yet if you're led by the Spirit, if the Spirit gets hold of your your quest for the truth of God's Word, the Spirit will lead you to that truth in spite of those dorkments, <laughs> in spite of those Absolutely, sleight of hands yes. and mistranslations. Right. Does that, that make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that is also reflective of uh, the work of individuals like Ivan Panin um, and also recently Bill McGregor in doing his work on the – in tying together how – each of the 66 books of Isaiah are reflected in the 66 books of the the canon. And, you know, Ivan Panin also shows mathematically um, that it was inspired in the way that we have it. And so, yes, even though there are things that were corrupted or changed, or and whether purposely or ignorantly, um, I do absolutely know that the canon is the inspired word of the Most High God, and that it will lead people to truth, and that we can uh, absolutely bank on what is revealed within it, and that um, even with the way that you know the equal distance letter sequencing, the ELS and the Bible codes are now arranged upon and built upon um, the the words of what we have as the authorized Bible, that it shows. Uh, a great deal, even prophecies now are contained and being revealed through this uh, ELS, which you need a computer really to be able to to discover the the, the in-depth um, nature of this code. but um, but also we see once you come to understand, yes, that is the foundation for truth. Uh, but when you begin to examine and read, uh, the other texts, and especially from more ancient sources and which are were closer to the original source, like the Aramaic Targum and this text that I'm uh, referencing, the Kaburis Codex, um, that you get even greater insight into the truth that is revealed and contained within the, the, the King James Bible, such as what we're talking about here with the feminine aspect of the Godhead, but other things which are little understood and that um, people don't speak much about, for instance, like, you know, the war in heaven and pre-existence and our connections to all of that, which when we come back from break, we'll go into some of those things in the, in the second hour. But even with the, you know, the serpent seed and the enmity between the bloodlines and all of that, that plays out in great detail within the Targum and is very clear in Genesis 3, 4, and 5, 
which studying the context of the Hebrew, it is also very clear within the King James. It's just something that has uh, become lost and traditionally not taught anymore in the mainstream churches. And because of that, um, when people are confronted with it or brought this information is brought forth, they are largely opposed to it only because they have been indoctrinated into belief that, you know, that is um, a reading into the text or adding into the text. When it's clear, you know, in scripture that Christ tells us he knew us before the foundations of the world. Um, and that even with Jeremiah, with the word of the Lord going to Jeremiah and saying, I knew you before you ever entered into the womb of your mother. I had foreordained you to be a prophet unto the nation, that those kind of things are also referenced to all of us, not not just Jeremiah, but that all of us pre-existed in aspect to where the Most High in some manner knew us. And in my opinion, that all those things are tied to, you know, our spiritual embodiment um, as bright natured beings before we came into and entered into flesh form, uh, which, you know, again, we'll go into some of that when we come back. But uh, would you care to comment hmm. before we? <laughs> yeah, I could comment a lot. I mean, you're really oh, yeah, on sure. a lot of material. Right. Um, but uh, OK, I want to get back to uh, the, the uh, <clears throat> stuff that's drilled in our heads. Another example in in my paradigm shift on a, a certain topic was was a serpent dealing with Eve, okay? So there's a traditional story about, you know, the apple, right? Well, right, when right. you think about that, how logical is that? It doesn't play out, right? right. Um, but, but, but you just, well, the book is a book of faith. We're not really supposed to understand it. <laughs> well, yeah. if you can't understand God's word, then what use is it? Is it? Yeah, <laughs> okay? totally. I agree, yeah. <laughs> you know, go read a comic book or something. <laughs> Right. Okay. We got to start taking God's word as real, and and there's literal aspects to it. There's figurative. There's symbolic. There's multi-dimensionality, multi-layers to it, and <clears throat> and everything. Okay. But for example, the um, the concept, the idea that the serpent seduced Eve and had sex with her. Okay. So prior to 2010, I had lightly come across that idea probably years and years before, but I kind of put it off to the side because, I, you know, I wasn't ready to deal with it. I didn't really have the resources to dig deeper, you know, like reading a book uh -huh. or something or anything. But uh, so it, off to the side, on a shelf, that kind of thing, right? But in 2010, when I first got to know uh, our friend John, um, and, he, and he was uh, starting up his his uh, ministry more more in, uh, in depth, you know, and stuff. So he had, um, gosh, what is it called? Uh, a forum or something where people could, uh, you know, type in and ask questions or comment different topics and everything. So there's a guy on there that really went into depth about the serpent and Eve. And so I read some of his comments on there and it's like, oh, my goodness. I mean, when you think, think about it, that our first mother was raped. Right. Right. That just doesn't set well. <laughs> Where's yeah. that serpent? I want right. to beat his head into the wall. Okay? <laughs> right, yeah. And that's probably. just for beginnings, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where is that serpent? <laughs> okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my goodness. I mean, that is, that's a tough one to chew on. Mm -hmm. Okay, for a number of reasons. It just, you, you don't want to go there and you're thinking. Yeah. Right. And so it's understandable why, you know, so many people just don't want to go there in their understanding of that story and another one is the the sons of god that came down okay well they the, well it was the uh, sons of uh, cain you know cain right, right, his yeah. lineage you know were the sons that uh, no, versus the sons of seth okay no and the deep the deeper understanding is clearly like you said is clearly the, the watchers came down there's no other interpretation but it's disturbing right. it's very yes. disturbing and so a lot of these deeper understandings of things are just plain disturbing, and you just don't want to go there. But if you're going to understand the deeper aspects of God's word, 
you have no choice but to go down those rabbit holes. Right. And if you have to go down a rabbit hole, like I feel like I've been down a multiple, multiple rabbit holes in the last 40 some years, right? Mm-hmm. And if, literally, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ being right there to help me through that or to lift me up out of the rabbit hole, I might have been stuck in a few of them. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I can say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it, it's easy uh, to get caught up in going. And there's so much disinformation, so much confusion out there. And there's so many people that uh, are opposed to truth because, as you said, it makes them feel uncomfortable or it just simply does not um, fit into their paradigm for understanding uh, the Bible or even the worldview as far as what's going on. But looking consequentially at what occurred to Adam and Eve and the serpent, how eating this fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then afterwards they, because they were before naked and unashamed, and then somehow they become embarrassed and want to hide their genitals and then hide themselves away from the most high god knowing that they had done something wrong and then the consequences of the their eve being beguiled is that she would now have to bear children in sorrow uh, you know and to bear to bring forth children in childbirth um, whereas the serpent the the punishment placed upon him, not only is he put upon his belly and forced to lick the dust of the earth and to feed upon the dust of the ground, but he there would be enmity between his seed and her seed. And so how does any of that make any kind of sense uh, if it was not in some way um, sexually uh, tied to her corruption, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, speaking of her, you know, losing her chastity. Um, and so, you know, those kind of things, even though they may, yeah, be uncomfortable to a lot of people, when you really open yourself to the context of what is revealed, especially in the Hebrew, I mean, in my mind, there's there's no other way really to interpret it and to make sense of it in the way that it is uh, placed within the word. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Well, we've got uh, time for just the final comment here, and then we'll go to break. And then when we come back, we'll pick up on some of the other topics that I had made mention of. Okay, you were reading uh, before of uh, Proverbs chapter 8, and there's an uh, interesting. Um, Let's see. Uh, I'll continue here in uh, 34 through 35, 36. Blessed is the man that hears me watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whosoever finds me finds life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sins against me wrongs his own soul, and they that hate me love death. Yes. Now, what did Jesus say? <laughs> okay, I'm right. pulling that up here. Um <clears throat> Yeah, it's slow. <laughs> Even though oh, yeah, I got it pulled good. up, it's slow. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Take your time. We still got an hour to set all this up. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Jesus said in uh, Mark 3.29, But whosoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Yes. And when yes. you think of the Holy Spirit being the, the original womb, the womb of all creation, and you're cursing the womb of original creation, you know, there, there's right. no forgiveness for that. Right. Because you're cursing yourself when you do that because you were brought forth out of her womb. Absolutely. And yes. when you curse her womb, when you curse her, you curse her womb, you curse your very existence. So, you know, it's like putting a bullet to your head, okay, <laughs> out of malicious intent. Right. That cannot be forgiven. Right. And Jesus right. earlier said, said, truly, I tell you, the sons of men will be forgiven of all sins and blasphemies, as many as they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Wow. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, hold on, brother. We'll be right yeah. back for a second hour, everyone.
Christian Radio at freedomslips.com. And we'll be right back after this message. When God resolved upon the creation of the world, he took counsel with the Torah. Her advice was this. O oh Lord, a king without an army and without courtiers and attendants hardly deserves the name of a king, for none is nigh to express the homage due to him. The answer pleased God exceedingly. Thus did he teach all earthly kings by his divine example to undertake not without first consulting advisors. The advice of the Torah was given with some reservations she was skeptical about the value of the earthly world on account of the sinfulness of men who would be sure to disregard her precepts. But God dispelled her doubts. He told her that repentance had been created long before and sinners would have the opportunity of mending their ways. Besides, the temple service would be invested with atoning power and paradise and hell were intended to duly as reward and punishment. Finally, the Messiah was appointed to bring salvation, which would put an end to all sinfulness. And so that is from the legends of the Jews. And we see that in the commentary about the most ancient account of the creation in Genesis, that again, wisdom, the Holy Spirit, that she is the Torah. She is the word of the Most High God, which we know Christ, of course, is the word of the Lord. But as far as the Torah, the law, uh, intelligence and wisdom, that is the Holy Spirit. And those three together are one. Remember in First John, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so again, even the word Trinity, Trinity, tri meaning three, and unity meaning one. So you have three in one. Uh, the concept of the Godhead as being the, the Trinity, but all still one and the same, but individual in aspect. And again, the, the Holy Spirit being the feminine aspect of the Godhead, of which female Eve uh, specifically was brought out of Adam. It was in the same that you see in a lot of the Nakamani codices, the same concept that Sophia comes forth from the father and then Christ comes forth from her as the only begotten. And so it's reflective of the same thing that we see in uh, the, the family. Um, and with regard to the family unit being a reflection, a mirror of the Godhead. Lauren? Yeah, amen. <clears throat> um, so, so some, yeah, some of these concepts are, and beliefs are difficult when you first hear them or notice them. Um, so like this one with... The Holy Spirit being feminine, that wasn't just something that uh, all of a sudden, out of the blue, you know, <laughs> you know, neon light. It was a, a, a gradual um, coming to understanding a little here, a little there over many years. And <clears throat> it was back in 87, I had come out here to Rapid City. I was intending to, to head out to L.A., uh, but I spent most of my time here in, in Rapid City, South Dakota, and then about... Uh, January of 88, and I finally headed out to L.A., and I spent most of the year in 88 in L.A., so I was searching for a computer work, and you usually think, well, how could that be very difficult, but there was a nationwide hiring freeze at the time in the computer industry, and I didn't know about that, so, you know, here I am out there trying to find work, and uh, L.A. is very expensive to live in, so, like, I was paying $200 a year for car insurance in South Dakota, and it was $2,000 or a little more out there in Los Angeles at that time. And just that in itself almost made it impossible for me to, to make it out there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, then in the meantime, I did some movie extra work. Um, so I, I got some of that under my belt, and uh, it was fun. Um, 
being in front of the camera and being behind the camera to see how things are done um, <clears throat> and uh, meet a few stars, that kind of thing. But I also had a lot of time on my hands, so I wasn't um, active all the time. So I had my Bible with me, and so I had a lot of time to, to read and study God's Word. So in my career path, for example, I've been more unemployed than I have been employed. But what the Lord has done, though, in those times of unemployment is I, I can't just sit on my butt doing nothing. <laughs> um, I got to be active with something. And so in this case, you know, I had my Bible with me and uh, didn't really, you know, go out with I'm not never been one to go to bars or anything like that. Right. So I had a lot of time to read the word. And <clears throat> so I was reading things that I've never heard from the pulpit. You know, I've been a church goer all my life, you know, never heard, uh, you know, the Bible, in, especially the Old Testament, makes mention of other books where things were written down. But it's like, well, why aren't they in the Bible then? <laughs> OK, right. if the Bible's making reference to these other books, then they had to have some kind of validity to the, to the time period that they those other books are written in. So why don't we have access to that information? And then there's certain um <clears throat> things that happen in the Old Testament that are just plain disturbing. And right. it's like, well, okay, I understand why there would be unpopular topics to uh, preach from the pulpit, but you could pull a few people that are top level off the side during a specialized Bible study to teach on these topics. But I've never, you know, all I ever encountered was resistance or put downs in the things that God was showing me, the advanced things. And so I kind of kept things to myself. Um, but here and there once in a while, God would open up the door to somebody who would at least listen to me, you know, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if it was connecting with them or not, but, um, sometimes, but, um, at least they, they had the kindness to listen. <clears throat> and that was important too. Sometimes we can go through life and we feel like we're a ship without a rudder and nobody's paying attention. Nobody wants to know what my story is, you know? Uh, I don't want to know anything about you. You feel that way sometimes, and you just feel like, you know, you go to church and they kick you when you're down. They kick you worse. And sometimes uh, there was an early 90s, I attended a new age group <clears throat> that was uh, into UFO stuff out here in Rapid City. And I felt such love and acceptance, unconditional love and acceptance, that I wasn't getting in a church. Okay? And it's like, how does this happen? <laughs> okay, These guys are more Christian than those that are claiming to be Christian. So, you know, in my path, I've seen all these, you know, uh, things back and forth and stuff that, you know, it's just kind of like befuddlement, but, you know, it's just the way it is. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think I literally thank God for that. You know, the Bible says that he's faithful to us, even when we aren't faithful to him. He is faithful to us. And uh, even sometimes when we're not aware of his guidance, he is still guiding us. And he knows yeah, the end game. Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. That also implies, if once you understand the deeper, um, like what Zen was referring to in Jeremiah, that where God says, I knew you before you were even in the womb. Well, how does that factor out? You know, what does that mean? And again, where do you hear that in the pulpit or in a Bible study or anything? You know, it's one of those uh, ones you scratch your head you know, and you move on in life, right? But there's a meaning behind that what God was saying to Jeremiah there, that has application. And it's very deep, and there's a lot of things in the Bible and things that are rarely touched upon in traditional Christianity, but are very, very deep. But we're in the last days. There's no question yes. about it. We're in the last days, the last uh, times on this earth. And this is the time when, when Jesus said, it is for you to know these mysteries. He said to his disciples. Yes, and so if you're absolutely. a disciple... If you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's for you to understand these mysteries, and this is the time you are to understand them. Yeah, I agree. Um, tell me kind of what led you to, because I, I absolutely agree, and my um, <clears throat> confirmation of this <clears throat> was, you know, the Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 with regard to uh, the parable of the fig tree. And the examination of that really uh, nailed it down to me that, yeah, we are that generation. But uh, tell us kind of your insight into 
uh, how it was that you were led to believe that we are at the end of days? Well, you know, it's like one of those things, you know, some people are born, uh, they just know almost like out of the womb, they're going to be a piano, piano player, or they're going to be an actor, actress, or they're going to be a politician or something. And I'm one of those people that I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do with my life, right? Mm. <laughs> I think it's because I'm interested in a lot of things. So it's not, yeah. I can't, I can focus, but to consider focusing my entire life on just one area, <clears throat> when there's so much out there. <laughs> That would be great to experience, you know, and I've experienced so little of it as far as worldly things. OK, but instead, what God has done is taken me into his his realm of the spiritual things. And if I would have a preference looking back, it would be where God has led me to these these topics and these understandings of things. And for a time such as this, to help others to understand God's word in a deeper level and to encourage people that the Bible is not a bunch of myths and legends and nonsense. It is 100 (laughs) percent on target. And what's the problem is, is been there's been a lot of misinterpretations and and purposeful sleight of hands and misdirections and everything, to to keep people from discovering the real truth of God's word, even within the 66 book canon. And so, <clears throat> uh, biblical prophecy was even early on in the 60s grabbed hold of me for some reason. And oftentimes, when my faith would had gotten like down to a nub, you know, things happen in life. And so sometimes we're thrown for a loop and sometimes we end up flat on our backs or or otherwise or something. And we just feel like, you know, um, (laughs) I don't know, a ship, again, a ship without a sail or a rudder or just a a wet rag, you know, just all beaten up a carpet, you know, be walked on by everybody. And, and sometimes you just feel like God's abandoned you. Okay. But it was just some, something that little flicker, inside of me that linked up with biblical prophecy. And so that oftentimes, that's what would keep me going or keep get me back up, back in the ring, so to speak. And then it's like God knows where our focus is. So, so for me, that was my like minimum focus area where he knew he could reach me and, and bring me back up and online, so to speak. And for somebody else, it might be something else, okay? It might be some other area or maybe uh, whatever, you know, maybe you have a gift of helps. You enjoy helping people. And so, you know, you're going through some some loops in life and stuff. And But if you can get back, you know, the Lord can get you back into that ministry of helps, then you're back up and running. That's your thing. That's, that's you know, <laughs> that's why you're here. It's ministry of helps or whatever it may be, okay? But that was for me what uh, always grabbed my attention. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, it's one thing, as Bible says, uh, line upon, that's in uh, Isaiah, line upon, line precept upon precept here a little, there, there a little, uh, that the foundation of our lives and, and our souls and, and our spirit persons can be built uh, in God's Word and in and through Jesus Christ, led by the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> and uh, so so yeah, that's and then you know, like I said, one thing leads to another. So things, uh, it's like a tree, you know, it starts out as a little seed, and then uh, then pretty soon you have this uh, little trunk with a few leaves, and then before you know it, you got this mighty oak tree that's branched all over the place, and so when you look back, it's kind of like how how things can become, and and uh, you know, it's like wow, it's quite a knowledge base over all these years. But even so, as much as I've learned over the years. It also highlights how much I don't know, <laughs> okay. how much there is still yet to know. <laughs> can, can you comment also on some of your discernment on the war in heaven and pre-existence and uh, things of that nature? Because a lot of people are familiar with my work on it, um, but we have similar discernment along those lines and so can you talk about those aspects of truth as well okay so again from the traditional model um it's taught that uh, you know god created adam and eve in his exact image and likeness and so um that has certain implications on, on what that means and uh um 
Let's see. Okay, so in in getting on board though the more advanced concepts of um, like the Luciferian rebellion and the war in the in the heavens and everything, the angel wars. Okay, so I, I wasn't aware of that in my early years. I knew about you know the the traditional teaching of the watchers and stuff, but the, then there was that blending of well maybe it's really talking about the lineage of Cain and stuff, you know, and certainly that Cain, you know. <laughs> The traditional teaching is he was the firstborn of Adam and Eve, but the deeper understanding is he was the firstborn of the serpent mm -hmm. and Eve. And again, that's just plain disturbing. How could that ever be? Okay. Well, okay, so when you re, uh, start reading up about the angel wars, you know, the, the one third that fell with Lucifer, and then you get into the um, – you know, read possibly in you know, a person's reading of the various angelic groups that may have been involved in that and fell with Lucifer. And so, <clears throat> one line of thinking that I came across a website back in I think it was 2001 when I first got on the internet, and it, it kind of disturbed me. And it, it, continue, it continues in my mind to be the wrong analogy or the wrong direction. But okay, so mankind was created as a replacement for the one-third angels that fell. So to me, that would imply that mankind was a replacement, an afterthought. And so I, I, I you know, chewed on that for a while, but no matter how I chewed on that, it didn't go down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it didn't work. It didn't sit well. It didn't sit well. And no matter how I looked at it, no matter, you know, going back a little while later and rereading or re reading scriptures again or something, trying to get a better angle of, of this, and uh, it just didn't pan out for me. Okay, because, and again, that's the traditional teaching that there was something very special about Adam and Eve. Okay, so if you relegate Adam and Eve to be an uh, afterthought, well, then I guess we're not very special, are we? Okay. And so that kind of was, you know, sometimes those things that disturb us in our thinking or in our spirit, spirit person, that the Lord can then, if, you know, we turn to him for a resolution. And again, sometimes it, it's not presto change. Oh, here it is. Sometimes you have to put things off to the side for a while, on a, on a shelf for a while, and go on with your life, you know. But in faith, believe that it, when the time is right, that the Lord will Bring that topic back off the shelf and introduce you to a more full or proper explanation. And that's happened to me many times through, throughout my life where I had to, in faith, put something off the side for a while. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, so what, what, what is it? Okay. So then it's reviewing. Okay. So back in the, I knew about Lucifer's fall from my early readings back in the 60s, you know, 60s, 70s, Hal Lindsay's late great, great planet Earth book and then the other book sequel was uh, Satan is alive and well in planet earth so he goes into great detail about uh, Lucifer's rebellion and everything and the, the fall of the angels but he, I, to my remembrance he doesn't go into the, any of the angelic groups that were involved that would come later like I said maybe about 2010 and onward that I'm reading more into uh, and along that lines <clears throat> Um, but I had an early understanding of that, but not a, obviously a complete understanding. But nevertheless, that was a very excellent foundation of understanding that, yes, there was a rebellion. There was some kind of war that happened. But even Hal Lindsey at that time probably didn't understand the full scope of what we now know today <laughs> Okay, through our studies and through Zen studies, my studies, uh, John, John studies, you know, and, and other people that Zen and I and John have interacted with, you know. <clears throat> Um, so these things are being revealed more and more in these last days so that we're prepared for what's to come. Okay, so okay, I'm going through this and I'm thinking, okay, so in the latter, about the latter 90s, turn of the century, God does another mind dump on me. <laughs> okay, in the early 90s, there was a, some, some key topics that were questions that were unresolved and I had to put them on the shelf. And uh, so by the mid-latter 90s into the turn of the century, again, God blows the barn door, doors off. So I'm sitting at home at my mother's table over a Christmas, and she loves to bring out her stuff, you know, and show me this and show me that. <clears throat> and she had put together a pamphlet for the, for the small town's uh, historical celebration.
And in that pamphlet, uh, the town is founded as a rock from a rock quarry that was founded first, and then the town grew up because of that rock quarry. And the the town, the rock quarry was founded, and then the town by five brothers, uh, known as the Five Ray Brothers, R-A-E, Five Ray Brothers. And they were all Masons, Freemasons. So back in that era, <clears throat> if you worked with rocks, you it's like um, a labor union of today, you know? So if you worked with rocks back then, you, you joined up with the labor union of that time, <laughs> but it was more than just a labor union. It was the Masons, the Freemasons. Okay, and so that's what you did. <clears throat> and so these five Ray brothers were Masons. And I submit to you folks that as much as the Masons, you know, may may be of the dark side. <laughs> okay, yet isn't it strange that the children of darkness so often have more of the light <laughs> than the children of light? See, the children of darkness take these things seriously, and they pass these things on generation to generation. And it's not that they pass them on uh, kindly or lovingly. Uh, oftentimes, these generational pass-ons are through a lot of um, what we ca call nowadays MK mind control techniques, where uh, the poor children are just <laughs> run through the ringer, and that's putting it mildly, psychologically, and uh, abused physically, mentally, sexually abused, and all this stuff is put on them to carry forth the lineage, okay, and the understanding of things. Uh, you know, there's got to be a better way of passing on this ancient tradition and knowledge base and wisdom from, the, from long ago, and there is, it's through God's word, okay where you have God's love and acceptance and healing and wholeness, where you don't have to have your your soul split into a hundred different alter egos, you know, <clears throat> in order to understand things. Okay, so children of light, it is possible to understand these deep mysteries and not leave it to them and them alone to understand and to manipulate the outcome. It's high time that we understand God's mysteries. And Jesus himself said, it's for you to understand the mysteries, he said to his disciples. So you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, and it's for you to understand these mysteries. So let's get on board here because we're running out of time. The clock is ticking. The seconds are down. Okay. And uh, the, the strong delusion is going to kick off. It's certain segments of it already have kicked off, and it's going to kick off big time at one of these where it just can't be held back any longer. <clears throat> Ready or not, here it comes, you know. And so um, I'm looking at this information. The Masons, they understand certain aspects of the Holy Bible. There's certain aspects of the Holy Bible that they regard as sacred to, to their tradition and their mystery understanding of things, that they regard as sacred, and they quote it. <laughs> they quote it, okay? And my mother is not a Freemason. She's a Christian, but she happened to quote what these Ray brothers had quoted and put it in this pamphlet, and they were quoting directly out of God's word, and specifically that, I, that it was like the big neon lights coming down when I read this. I mean, I knew it was there in the Bible, but you don't get the significance of it because it's not being taught. Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 19, that's the big bingo. If you want to understand Lucifer, what he, who and what he was, before he fell, how, uh, when he fell, and what transpired is contained right there in those verses. Okay? <clears throat> and so, earlier I was referring to in the beginning, okay? So, Jesus said that uh, the Satan was a murderer from the beginning, okay? So, the implication, that pe the wrong implication of what Jesus said is that, that people will say, well, that means that Satan, that God created Satan as Satan from the get-go. But that would be flat out wrong right. in relation to Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 19. Right. Specifically, 12 through, <laughs> specifically 12 through 15a. What part of perfect don't people understand? He was right. per created perfect, and he remained perfect in all, all his ways until iniquity was found in him. That word until is the point of deviation. Prior to that time, all of God's creation had been in perfect synchronicity to his will, let's say to his, 
his love, his law, his, his life, his liberty, everything about God and how he designed creation to operate was in perfect sync until we get to that word until. That was the point of delineation, the point of deviation of creation. That little point was that, um, what do you, what is it called? The, uh, a nexus point, um, uh, like the word escapes me, but it's been in for a number of years now. Um, that point where the inversion, a point of inversion, where uh, that's a point where the mother of all black holes began to be, to began to be created. Now, it wasn't God's creation. There are certain things in existence that were never part of God's plan A for his creation. And we're living in the fallen one third. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, we're living in the fallen one third. And this fallen one third is where God brought forth Adam and Eve. Now, is there what did Adam and Eve have pre existence? Is the question. Uh, and in relation to Jeremiah chapter one there. Okay. So I'm uh, this big neon light coming out, and God is just laying it on me. Ezekiel 28, and then tying in with Isaiah chapter 14. I think it's 12 through verses 12 through 14, the five I wills. But if you continue reading past that, you get an even deeper understanding that there were, prior to the Luciferian rebellion, there were civilizations on this planet and probably throughout creation. Now, we call them angelics, but I don't want to um, be so restrictive as because would you consider us as angels and yet we're a created life form right but we're not angels we're not of the angelic class okay so there would be just like in the picture world war ii you've got uh, all kinds of ships fighting in uh, the navy for example and you've got destroyers you've got light destroyers you've got heavy destroyers you've got light cruisers medium cruisers heavy cruisers and you got battleships you got light medium and heavy battleships with a big mo being one of the last ones to come on board towards the end of world war ii it's just a she's uh, just a beautiful <laughs> ship okay i just get excited about the big mo for some reason <clears throat> you don't want to be in her sights <laughs> okay um <clears throat> when her guns are going off okay so um so we have different classifications. When you look again, look at the world around you, the simplicity 101 of the world around us. Do we see when we think of God creating a dog, do we see just one variety of dog in existence? <laughs> okay. Oh, we see all kinds of dogs, all kinds of different kinds of dogs. And even within a certain uh, type of dog, sometimes they're diff- different uh, color of fur. <laughs> okay. Any, uh, just one kind of horse or all kinds of horses. Okay, so within any uh, range of species, we see all kinds of variation. So we can start out with a parent copy, but, excuse me, built into the DNA, the original DNA of that parent copy is a Fibonacci sequence of DNA. It's like a random number generator that can generate new sequences indefinitely. All right. So we have this built into our original DNA was this potential for endless sequence, endless outputs of variety. Our Abba Father is a God of variety. (laughs) Okay? Not sameness. Like, everybody's got to wear only this kind of outfit. (laughs) Or you're going to hell. (laughs) Kind of thing. Our Heavenly Father is a God of variety. And then about that same time period, is getting on board. Well, you know, again, look at the world around you, the Holy Spirit, turn of the century, look at the world around you. What do you see? Okay, well, look at the the oceans, you know, the water, look at the air, look at the land, okay? Um, <clears throat> there's water creatures. So if we go out in the water as is, we're going to drown to death because we're not designed to live in the water. <laughs> okay. Simple 101, right? You take a fish out of water, and they're not designed to live on the land, so they're going to die too. Isn't that strange? You know, No, it's just the way it works. So water is like a dimension. 
air is like a dimension, the land is like another dimension, and you can, might might say up there in the upper atmosphere, the space kind of range, you know, another di dimension. And you think in terms of of uh, websites, you know, we have the different layers, uh, photoshopping layers, right? In so you have a composite image that you look at that composite image and it looks all one. You cannot see unless you know how it was programmed. You cannot see the various layers. You know, this picture brought in, this text brought in, something else, you know, an advertisement brought in from somewhere else, all coming from all places on the planet to give you what you see on that screen. Now, the programmer who's programmed that knows that, and those who deal with the forensics of, you know, what we see on the screen knows that. But if you're just somebody, you know, just looking at the screen, you you, you, you just see the composite image. And so that's like we here on this planet. We're just seeing the composite image. We just, you know, the water, well, it's just water, you know, oceans, you know. <laughs> we don't view them as a as a dimension. We don't view the air as a dimension. We don't view living on land as a dimension. And these are just dimensions within our own physical reality, our 3D dimensional, our five sense reality. But there are dimensions even beyond our five dimensional sensory capacity. There are dimensions that are right in front of our face and we can't see them. Now, there are some people who are, I don't know, gifted or cursed, however you look at it, but they can see into these other realms. And especially if you take like drugs, like LSD, and I, I want to tell everybody I've been 100% clean my whole life. No drugs, no alcohol, no cigarettes. Okay, 100% clean. And yet I can tell you that it is possible to shift into an altered state of reality being clean. You don't have to have drugs. You don't have to get drunk. You don't have to get weirded out. You can just kind of like shift, okay? You just have to be in a classroom of a boring math, uh, high-end mathematics teacher telling you about differential equations and, and constructs and everything to just kind of start zoning out because you're so bored by it, you can't link up with it, right? And this actually happened to me. So I'm sitting in college classroom, mathematics class, and the, the professor is a brilliant guy. Okay, but it just doesn't didn't know how to bring it down at least to my level. Okay, <clears throat> but I'm I'm shifting into an altered state. I'm just kind of you know when you get into that like I don't know alpha one zone or something. You're not asleep, but you're not awake. You know, and that equation he had written on the chalkboard. That was the days before internet, so they put stuff on chalkboards. Um, <clears throat> took on it's kind of like in a sense of a plus b equals c. So A and B and that plus sign was was some kind of a conflict between the two and then the equal sign and then a resolution was taken on personifications. OK, it's like, wow, I'm beginning to understand this, you know, in this altered state. It's like, wow, you know, it's like the door opened up into another realm. But as soon as I realized what, what was going on and I'm coming back into my regular consciousness, I sense that that door into that other realm was closing behind me. And then I lost it, except for the memory of what happened. But I could no longer, you know, capture the full essence of what I experienced because it was on the other side, okay? Um, so in trying to figure out uh, Adam and Eve, okay, so then then I read this article about, you know, where these angelic groups and that God had the theory that this author had that God created mankind as a replacement for the angels that fell. That didn't set well with me. And so that then lent itself to a road of discovery on what the real situation, the real answer was. And, <clears throat> and it came basically, okay, so – you have Lucifer, you have Ezekiel 28, 12 and 13 are key to understanding the nine stone covenant. That He's the nine stones, nine stones comprised him. He was created with nine stones, precious stones. And what the Holy Spirit directly revealed to me, I had not read this anywhere, or nobody taught me, at least not that I remembered. Okay, so to me it was a direct revelation that uh, Lucifer, at that up to that point of time, was the high priest of creation uh -huh. because those nine stones are the breastplate just like in israel in the old testament the high priest would be the only one allowed to put on 
to EFIT and then put on the breastplate over the top and some other items, holy items, before entering into the Holy of Holies. See, that's what the Holy Spirit connected me with, was the high priest of Old Testament Israel. And they would put these items on to enter into the Holy of Holies. So then connecting that with the nine precious stones that comprise Lucifer, that means that he was the high priest of creation. And what did the high priest in the Old Testament do? At that point, there was sin. But at the point here, Lucifer, he was still perfect. So there was no sin yet at this point. Okay. Right. <clears throat> and so um, the high priest is the go-between. So he goes into the Holy of Holies to present the prayers and petitions of the people that he represents. And then when he comes back out, he brings the latest word of, of God. Okay, uh, uh, so that's what Lucifer would do. He had a personal audience with a triune God. Imagine that, folks. He wasn't created evil and malignant and dark from the get-go. So that phrase, in the beginning, is more accurately in, quote, the beginning, unquote. In the beginning, that time before time, Lucifer was perfect, and he was the high priest of the Nine Stone Covenant. Now, what was to transpire was, you'll find this in Ezekiel, I, I don't have it up right now, but it's in uh, something like chapter 40 through 48, to the end of the Ezekiel, it deals with the temple, and how the temple is to be constructed, and all the significance of all the different rooms and steps and everything, and it's beyond my understanding, but there's certain things that I did that the Lord quickened to me. And one right smack dab in the middle of all this description is a description of the of um, a prince, okay? So it's like um, the prince is allowed to give gifts to those who are not in line for the inheritance. But at the end of a certain time, those gifts are to be returned to the prince so he can then give them out to his children who are to receive the inheritance. Okay, so picture. See, that was another bingo for me in understanding this whole equation. Okay, God had some children already online. So what the eventual revelation was that is that those of us who are, are Adamites were within our father's loins from before creation itself. Yes. So that means that if you're an Adamite and you know it, you know it, and you're a knower that you're an Adamite. That you're not a former fallen angel now in a earth suit, human earth suit, but you are an Adamite. Okay. That means that you pre existed creation, that you were in your father's loins before all this was created, before even Lucifer was created, and all creation was created for the glory of God, but specifically as an inheritance for his children. And that you and I, as Adamites, were to be Jesus' inheritance as son, as brothers and literal. Bro, I can pull up scriptures. I probably don't have time tonight. That directly, once you understand this, it's like you can't. It's like Zen is saying, once you understand some of these things, you can't go back to right. believing the way you used to believe. Literal brothers and sisters to the Lord Jesus Christ. Sons and daughters of the Most High God. Romans 8, 19 has, has you know, traditionally been viewed as a prophecy of something yet to come to pass, okay? Uh, the manifestation of the sons of God, but I would include the daughters as well, sons and daughters of the Most High. Okay, the manifestation. So that means that that manifestation ha did not happen. What was really also disturbing is to realize that, you know, God had this wonderful creation and plans to bring us forth originally within Genesis 1-1, but Lucifer did not want to become submissive to you and me. Right. That's what it boils down to. So it was okay if you're submissive to Jesus, but now all these snot-nosed snot kids running around, and, and you know I mean me and my boys got to tutor them to rule and reign over us, and Lucifer you know, was the first not, and Zen, I remember you mentioning this from uh, one of the books you read, the, uh, I don't know, his gospel, one of those gospel things that, that's not, <laughs> we typically don't know about, but imagine that Lucifer was first created. 
Now, that was another direct revelation that God gave me was Lucifer, just right. in understanding how would this most exalted created being an angelic become the high priest of creation unless he was the first created and had right. been there, but not firstborn. Jesus is firstborn. Of all the brothers and sisters that would be born after, Jesus was firstborn and only begotten. Okay, because the rest of us have not yet been made manifest into our proper roles and places uh, as per God's original plan. See, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, but also the author and finisher finisher of our eternal destinies, what was originally meant to happen. And that means that God's plan A was interfered with by Lucifer and those who ended up following him. Right. But God was not caught off guard. He knows the beginning from the end. So think in, in terms, if you think in terms logically of God's mind as a, this super, super computer, that's so far superior to anything, you know, these qubit computers that were people are coming up with today in the fifth generation and artificial intelligence is just child's play compared to what God's mind can do, okay? And his technology is at his disposal. Just child's play. Just you know, get out of here, okay, kind of stuff. Um <clears throat> So it's hard for us to to come to grips that God's original plan could be, could have been interfered with, but yet that is the deeper revelation from the beginning to the end of the book uh, of the Bible is is this Luciferian rebellion and the angel wars, and then well, why did it happen? Why did here's Lucifer, who's the most exalted being ever created? And the anointed cherub that covereth God's creation, right there is another indication of his being a high priest of creation. He had all the perks, all the privileges, and the power, but none of the ultimate buck stops here type of responsibility. Why would you throw that away? Just because of pride? Pride of what? You got everything you could possibly have or ever want. And anything else that you want, you just ask for it because it had been perfect yet, okay? Why would you want to throw that off to the side unless you felt threatened? And so we see an example of Lucifer where he started leaning unto his own understanding. Where we read that in the Old Testament, you know, lean not unto your own understanding, okay? So he began to start rationalizing and leaning unto his own understanding of things. And, you know, one thing leads to another, and... I can't help but believe that God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all trying to get him back on track. You know, our Father is has patience and long-suffering, right? So, <clears throat> but, you know, they came, there came a tipping point where Lucifer kept, you know, just, it's like God dealing with us, you know. If we continue to push him off to the side or continue to just ignore him or throw him behind our backs, eventually it comes a point where, you know, I'm sorry, but right. I can't strive with you anymore. I'm going to just have to right. leave you to your own devices and go your own way and suffer the consequences. Yeah. And so that's kind of what happened with Lucifer in spite of him having been created perfect. And this is another example of a false doctrine of once saved, always saved because Lucifer was created saved. Okay, he was created safe. Now imagine being created as first created and being in the presence of the holy triune God and of not only created full and complete and perfect with God's light and love and law and liberty and everything about the Godhead, but then from that point forth, absorbing because he's in the direct presence of the Godhead, absorbing even more of the Godhead into himself, he becomes a mere image of the Godhead. So when he goes out in his role as a high priest, he's putting forth, projecting forth the mere image of the Godhead. And that's why even today in his fallen state, why he can appear to certain people, he can appear to them as the real Jesus because he was in the presence of real Jesus for eons of time. Why I can appear as the Most High God because he was in the presence of the Most High God for eons in time. And why he can appear as the Holy Spirit because he was in the presence of the Holy Spirit for eons of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's why he can do that because he was there. He knows how it all works. <laughs> right. And he, he knew that he ended up knowing when God announces his, his plan that, you know, here's this creation and Lucifer's high priest. And now what are you talking about? Well, right there in Ezekiel, in uh, the middle of that description of the temple about the prince, he can dish out gifts. But at the end of that 
time period, those who have received those gifts have to turn them back in so he can dish them out to his children, to the rightful inheritors of his kingdom, okay? That's us, Adamites. Lucifer and the angelic realms were meant to be our nannies and, and caretakers until we were brought online, okay? And that's reflected, I think, in the book of Galatians chapter 4, first half of Galatians chapter 4, if I remember correctly correctly it is dead on what it's talking about there and there's other so many other examples of the rights of the firstborn now when you understand come to understand the rights of the firstborn and how critical that is and you understand why the serpent went after eve what good would have had done him to go after adam he can you know he can get adam to you know into you know you know what i'm talking about you know get adam to do that but it's just going to go to the ground and do nothing so you know he's got to go after eve cuz eve has the womb right. okay? eve has the womb to bring forth life adam doesn't have the womb the serpent ain't stupid <laughs> And so he goes after Eve, and he, he probably schmoozed her up really good. Okay, really schmoozed her up really good. Hey, you're looking good. See, they were naked at that time, and they didn't know any different. They were innocent in how they mm -hmm. viewed each other. Right. Just like you put two little uh, babies and uh, a girl and a boy in a bathtub playing, and they're just having a good time together. Right. They don't know any different. <laughs> okay, they're innocent. Mm -hmm. And it's us, because we're fallen now, we, we've come into the age of fallenness. And so in our adult, you know, after that, about age three, four, you know, we start noticing there's a difference. And so then we start noticing there's a difference. And so then there's the questions. And so then <laughs> this, this story comes into mind about Adam and Eve and all that, all that played out. And so why the serpent knew that if the firstborn of Adam and Eve would have been Adam's firstborn, then the serpent would have been cut out. So the serpent had to get to the finish line first. He had to get there before Adam got there. So he did get there. He seduced Eve and interjected his sperm into Eve's womb and begat the first human alien hybrid. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that provided the precedent opened the door for what would later transpire in Genesis chapter 6 where the watchers came down. Right. Okay. So it's likely, most likely, had that serpent not succeeded, that that door for the watchers would have remained closed. Because right. that's how sin begat sin. One thing leads to another. And it and, and just this black hole. So you black hole. And the only way out of this black hole that we live in is through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. I fully agree. That's been my assessment on it as well. Um, but I, I want to give you a chance to continue story just for a few more minutes. We've got four minutes remaining. And also, okay. uh, one more time, give out where people can go and listen to um, the collected works as far as the shows and, you know, going back four years now, four <laughs> yeah. and a half, as you say. Yeah. Um, because I'm sure you cover a lot of this in the work that both you and John do, since you both share discernment with me on on these particular revelations. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. I don't have a website yet. Uh, to, for me, it's like this, some of this information gets overwhelming. It's like, how do you shrink this down? And Zen, you've you've like really done a great job in doing that, taking these complex do ancient documents and topics and shrink them down. You know, so in layman's terms where people can understand them and they are very well written and, and presented. <clears throat> I haven't arrived there yet. So at this point I'm still verbal in the verbal mode, you know, but I, mm -hmm. I hope and pray that the day will come when I'll just, okay, download time, get it written down, put it right. Down. right. Um, well, at least you have it, you know, in archive as far as radio broadcast. Cause yeah, a lot yeah. of people don't read, you know, unfortunately. So at least you have that out there for them. Yeah, it's called the, the Peterson, the Peterson Chronicles. You can just uh, type in, you know, do a Google of Peterson Chronicles, and you come up with a number of shows. And at some point, um, I don't know, the past year or something, John took them all down um, for fear of copyright violation, and he had taken down uh, Tribulation Dash Now and reworked them. So he's doing that now through what he calls the best of. So he's going through the the uh, earlier um, shows and uh, remastering them. 
and putting them back out as the best of, and as well as we're doing, you know, current shows. And currently, as I said before, I'm dealing with this uh, DNA thing. And I'm going heavily into the Tower of Babel. It's uh, only nine verses in the 11th chapter of Genesis, but within that nine verses is like nine volumes of information, <clears throat> if you understand it properly. But again, it's been mistaught. And um, there's so much that, folks, there's just so much that's been mistaught and sleight of hand, some purpose, some it's out of ignorance. Um, you really have to press into the Lord you know, and and be faithful. And sometimes, like I said, you put something off on a shelf for a while and just know that when the time is right, the Lord will, you know, dust it off the shelf and bring it forth to you again. And uh, then you can run with it some more. <clears throat> um, so there was an original creation and it went bad because of Lucifer. He didn't like the idea of become subservient. And that's borne out in the, um, the story of the, um, the laborers. Um, that's one of the ways is the laborers. Um, the, the, the master is hiring laborers, you know, the, the, the guy who's got to bring in the harvest. So he's got to go to town and hire some laborers. So gets towards the end, you know, and he's got to have some more workers. So he goes back into town, hires, gets some more workers for the last hour. Okay. And he's paying the same amount of money that uh, everybody else has been earning the whole day. He's paying his last hour. And the, the, the first workers are just throwing a fit because, you know, seniority, you know, seniority. So right there, that story back reflects reflects backwards to one of the how you know how we can understand Lucifer rebelling that he felt like well I'm first created I should have seniority me and my boys <laughs> okay and this last creation of mankind being brought forth to be manifested okay well they're the low end of the totem pole you know <laughs> and and so he, he didn't like that. <clears throat> and he didn't like to be put under our feet. There's another theme that runs throughout the Bible. Not, uh, there's firstborn. You'll see that in the battle between uh, um, e Esau and Jacob. I believe that Jacob was meant to be firstborn, but Esau got there first just by like a millisecond of time, got through the finish line first. And that was, a, uh, you know, the battle of, of those two bloodlines ever since then. Okay, <clears throat> the Edomites versus the the uh, Jacob slash Israel descendants, and that's still played out today, folks. Still being played out, in politics, religion, military, right smack dab in today's headlines. The Edomites have taken over. Oh, they've even taken over our churches. Okay, <clears throat> with false doctrines, and false teachings. The Edomites, and you can throw in a few otherites in there too. <clears throat> um, so there's a lot. There's a lot to digest, and uh, it's it's not always easy. It's been sometimes a struggle for myself, for Zan, for John. You know, we go through conditions sometimes, but we, we try to remain faithful, and we pray that you'll remain faithful as well. Hey, brother. I appreciate yeah. you, man. God bless all. Hope you enjoyed the show. Until next week. Until you bet. Long. God bless you all. Thank you. Appreciate you, brother. God love Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message.